الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم الله سبحانه وتعالى has designed human beings or actually has created human beings so that they worship him and that they worship him alone now as part of our challenge as human beings and as part of the test of this life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created distractions and those distractions they are designed by nature to distract a human being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if you think about the word distractions many people have different definitions so if you're a student in college or you're a student in high school then your parents tell you this is a distraction your friends are a distraction your this is a distraction your that is a distraction so they have a way by which they're defining distraction meaning they say you are studying at this point in your life and if you do anything aside from studying they will call that a distraction right when you're working and you're at work then your boss or your company defines what's a distraction so they don't want you going on the internet they don't want you wandering around from to website to website answering personal emails taking personal phone calls because say these they, these are distractions we pay you to do a certain amount of work in a certain amount of time we expect this much productivity anything that takes you away from that is a distraction so we use this word distraction very loosely and everybody can apply it to their particular situation but actually the truth of the matter is the word distraction applies for every single thing that takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because actually that's why we're created we have been created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise his great name and to thank him for what he bestows upon us and to teach others to do the same every single thing outside of the realm of the sharia that addresses this issue is considered a distraction now the way the heart is designed in the heart is where the essence of the matter lies Actually when we say somebody is distracted or somebody is focused what we mean is their heart is distracted or their heart is focused all right now for example if you're if you're studying for an you're studying for a class in college and you're sitting there and reading in your heart is the desire to go out and play or to go and play some kind of sport or to watch some kind of sport or to go out and have fun even though you're not doing it actually you're distracted you're sitting and studying but your heart is someplace else so that's when you're distracted now if you're actually out on the soccer field playing but your heart is totally into your test and you're running through some physics formulas in your mind and you're really thinking about the test and what the questions are going to be on the test and you're thinking about what the teacher said and applying it in different places even though you're playing on the soccer field actually you're not distracted from your purpose if you're a student so it's really your heart that is either attached or detached now in the realm of the deen the goal is that a person attach their heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they be continuously focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that or that concept we can say is actually termed wuquf okay, this is a term that you do, use in the science of spiritual development it's called wuquf now what do we mean by wuquf In the Arabic language there's a verb waqafa yaqifu. Waqafa yaqifu means to stop or to stand still. It's an Arabic term. So when we say wuquf we mean that you stop or you stand still. And actually then we throw in a qualifier wuquf al-qalbi. Stopping or standing still of the heart. This is actually the goal of every believer. Now what do I mean by stopping the heart or making the heart stand still? Okay, the way the heart is designed is that it constantly flutters, it constantly moves from idea to idea to idea to idea. That's the way it's it's nature. 
The physical heart does the same thing. It's constantly in flux. It's constantly beating. The spiritual heart, the heart that's supposed to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is always in movement. It jumps from idea to idea to place to thing to idea. It's always coming up with something new. That's the way the heart is made. Now once in a while, that heart gets stuck on something. And when that heart gets stuck on something, we say that the heart has achieved wukuf. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're driving down the street, right? And there's this horrible car accident. And you see, you see people laying on the ground. They're bloody. They're laying on the ground. There's a mother screaming. You see a small baby in her arms, all bloody. That scene, it impresses you. Right? It creates an impression within your mind, within your heart. And what happens? You start thinking about that 24-7. Now what happens? You drive away. You're thinking about the accident. You're thinking, what happened? Wow, that was really bad. I can't believe that that happened to that family. That was so sad. And then what happens is the phone rings. You pick up the phone. and Your friend calls you. You say, you're not going to believe what I just saw. There was this incredible accident on the street. Everybody was all bloody. It was just the worst thing I've ever seen. Now what happens is you go home. And then you start telling your family about the accident you saw. Then you lay down for bed. And you, as you lay down for bed, your mind is on that accident. All right, the next day you go to work. While you're working, you're sitting and typing them. You're thinking, what would happen if I got in an accident like that? SubhanAllah, Allah protected me from an accident like that. Wow, that was a really bad accident. I wonder what happened to that family, right? So now you can see that over a 12, 14, 16, 24-hour, perhaps 48-hour period, throughout that extended length of time, you became focused on something. And actually what happened is your heart became focused on something. That's called wukuf. Now, we can understand wukuf in the context of the dunya because of the fact that we are constantly feeding ourselves dunya. All right, what is wukuf? Some people get caught up in, let's say there's a big playoff series, right? There's a big basketball playoff series and their favorite team is in the playoffs. Now what happens for two weeks, three weeks, a person goes into wukuf. They're thinking about the game. They're thinking about when the next game is going to be. They're reading everything they can about the game. They're talking to as many people as they can about the game. They're checking every website about the game. They're waiting for the pregame. Then they watch the game. Then they listen to the post game. Then they're wondering what's going to happen in the next game. So what happens? Throughout that entire sphere, a person gets totally stuck on that particular thing. All right? And it's possible. That's, the, that's what I want to highlight to you. Now, that is an example from the life of this earth, from the earthly life. But actually what the goal of every believer is that this become our state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that no matter where we go, no matter who we talk to, no matter who we see, no matter what happens, we are just constantly thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else shakes us, moves us the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. And that's what we mean by wukuf in the science of development of the heart. We want that our hearts become totally stuck on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that every time we talk to somebody, we're thinking of Allah. Every time we wake up in the morning, we're thinking Allah woke us up. When we go to bed at night, we're thinking Allah's putting us to bed. Before we eat, we're thinking Allah's feeding us this food. Right? Before we put on our clothes, we're thinking Allah is covering our bodies with this material. And that's exactly what the sunnah embodies. So you see that the Prophet ﷺ made so many du'as during the day. When he woke up in the morning, when he put on his clothes, when he ate his food, when he completed his food, when he walked into the washroom, when he walked out of the washroom, when he left his home, when he came into his home, when he went into the masjid, when he left the masjid, when he shook someone's hand, when he left a gathering, when he concluded a gathering, when he started a gathering, throughout his entire 24-hour life, you see that he's constantly making various dua. And what do they all do? They all tie back into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now these weren't just words that the Prophet sallallahu memorized. These weren't just statements that he randomly made. These were statements of a man completely fixated on his Lord. Completely focused on Allah and what Allah has bestowed upon him. What power Allah holds in his hand. And what Allah can do with us on the day of judgment. Now it's in that context that the Prophet ﷺ says what he says when he wakes up. Says what he says when he begins to eat, when he finishes eating, etc. 
And that is the goal of the mu'min that they attain this concept called wukuf of the heart. And that's actually what our training is designed to do. Now, when an individual desires to obtain wukuf, they require an initiation period and they require a propagation period. And every believer falls into this. Either you're initiating that period or you're propagating that period. Now, in order to just give you an example of what wukuf is, everybody experiences wukuf in the beginning of their Islamic development. For example, a person is just totally heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't worry about Allah, doesn't think about Allah, doesn't reflect on Allah, does not worry about how Allah wants him to live his life, wants her to live her life. All of a sudden, one day, out of some magical blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, somebody wakes up. Now they begin to see that Allah created me, Allah is going to, has, has demands on me, and Allah will ask me about those demands on the Day of Judgment. I have some responsibility, I have some purpose here. So what happens? The individual wakes up. Now people like to say, when I woke up, when I came to the deen, actually it has nothing to do with I. When Allah woke us up, when Allah brought us into the deen. Now what happens is, in that initial period, a person experiences high upon high. Tears down their spine, electrical sharks, uh, sparks going down their spine, tears coming from their eyes. They are just totally gone in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that no matter what people talk to them about, no matter what they're studying, no matter what they're working on, no matter what they're doing, they are just constantly thinking about Allah. It's a very strange situation. But what's ironic is that everybody can relate to it. Each person in this room can come to me and say, there was one time in my life when I experienced this. Now for some people it lasts a week. For some people it lasts six months. For some people it lasts a year. But invariably, the next thing that people will say is, there was a time that I experienced this. Meaning it came before, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. And most people can tell you that they had this time in their life, and then subsequently it disappeared. Now that actually is the taste test. You know if you go to Jewel, or you go to the grocery store, when somebody comes out with a new product, they sit there and they give you a little bit of free product. So let's say Coca-Cola makes a new flavor. They want you to get hooked on that flavor. Actually, they're trying to hook you, right? So they bring you that flavor and then they have you taste it so that you taste it once and then you start thinking, okay, I really like that. Where can I get more? Then you go and you buy it. Now, once you buy it a little bit more and you're hooked and now you're constantly buying it and they've created a consumer, which is what their goal is, right? So this is exactly how American business drives people into going after something. They hook you into it. Come and have a free test drive. We'll give you two tickets to some play. You come and test drive our car. You're thinking about it. Okay, they're gonna, I have to spend no money to get the test drive. It's only five minutes of my time to test drive this car. How can they give me two tickets to this play, which are worth $50 each? The reason why is because they know that when you come test drive the car, you're going to get hooked on it. You're going to get hooked on the smell of the new car, the shine of the new car, the feel of the new car. And so what you're going to end up doing is you're going to start thinking about that new car. Then you're going to go home, and for a $50 small fee, they got you hooked on considering buying their car, which for them is worth it because they're going to make money when you buy the car. So this is the way people hook you on things. And in the same way, but to the nth degree, when an individual first realizes or when Allah wakes them up, they get this special feeling, which is a type of wukuf. It's a type of their heart being fixated on something. It's given for free. It's given for, with very little effort. And what happens is that person is on cloud nine as far as deen is concerned. They are hooked into the deen. Now, that taste is actually what the deen is. It's not something about the past. It is the reality of the deen. And actually the deen goes beyond that taste were a person to actually pursue it. But that is what it means to be in a state of wukuf. When a person has that feeling in their heart... They are in a state of wukuf. They are hooked into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the most powerful force in the universe. So it creates an incredible feeling of awe within a human being. All right, so now that was the free taste test that everybody has. Now, in order to maintain that taste, a person has to go through one of two phases, which is what I was mentioning earlier. Either they have to initiate that or they have to propagate that. Now, what do we mean by initiate that? 
By initiating that, what I mean is that you have to sacrifice your life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That wukuf that's given to you is, is a highlight for what your goal is. It's a taste to tell you what the deen is about. Then what you have to do is you have to give 1,000% of yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns Himself back to you 10,000 fold. You take one step towards Allah, He comes back to you with 10. You come walking to Allah, He comes back to you running. All right? So this is what happens, but you have to give yourself completely. You will not get that feeling back. You will not re-experience the deen. You will not connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that initial way until you give yourself up 100%. Look, if you are a ship, right, and you want to get out of a harbor, you have to remove the anchor completely. You have, Let's say you have 100 anchors that are bolting down the ship. And you pick up 99 anchors and you leave one, the boat's going to drag. It's going to drag. It's not going to move the way you want it to move. It's the same way with a human being. You can give 90%. You can give 95%. You can give 99.9%. But until you give 100%, your boat will drag. It will drag. You have to submit 100% to the Sharia, 100% to the Sunnah, 100% to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do so, that is where the pleasure of this deen lies. Now that's what I mean by the initiation period, okay? And this is what you find in the spiritual journey of every single righteous person in the history of this deen. All right? Even the prophets prior to us, and even the Prophet wasallam, they have this not because it was necessary for their development, because in the case of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected them and made them what they were. But as a highlight to us, for example, the Prophet wasallam, we know, spent how many months in the cave Right, waiting for the revelation to occur. Now in that period of time, the Prophet ﷺ was donating his money away to the poor. He was reflecting on his purpose in, in life. He was focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then this became the backdrop through which the Prophet ﷺ received his revelation. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected the Prophet ﷺ, and he didn't need to create this backdrop, but it's done to historically highlight to us the importance of spiritual development. Now, in the matter of the dunya, we do this as well. Look, if a person wants to become a physician, then what do we say? We say you have to go to medical school. Now, when you're in medical school, you're not going to worry about patients. It's so strange. You're in medical school and you're not allowed to touch the patient. In medical school, you have to study how to work with the patient. Eventually, you'll become a resident. Then we'll let you touch the patient. Then we'll let you work and figure out what's going on. Now, of course, you get a little bit of exposure in the middle of medical school, but not the way that you would be treating a patient completely. Why? Because that's your period of training. You need to study. You need to focus. You don't need to do other things during that time. When you do so, then you'll go into another phase in your life in which you'll be able to study less, but you'll be able to practice more. Practice more on patients in that in this example. It's the same case in the dean. There comes a period in every person's life where they have to develop themselves. So what does that mean? It means they have to pull away from their environment. They have to leave what they're used to being in, what they call home, who they call friends perhaps, what they call their daily routine. And they have to pull away from it and then reconnect themselves back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it takes time. It may take a week. It may take a month. It may take a year. But it doesn't matter because you have to decide to go knocking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's door. We don't control when Allah opens the door. We can only control the fact that we knock. So we go there, we face Allah, we knock on His door, and we pray that He opens it and lets us in to that pleasure of being connected to Him. So that's the initial phase that's required in order to obtain wukuf, in order to obtain permanence permanence of one's heart being focused on Allah. And everybody has to go through it. And I'm just going to tell you, very clear cut, very straightforward, point blank, then unless you give yourself 100%, you will always be dragging in the deen. In this initial phase, you have to do that. You have to give yourself to whatever it might be that you in whatever realm you want to develop. Now that's the initial phase. Then what happens is eventually through that, a person develops a connection with Allah. How do they know they develop a connection with Allah? The sunnah begins to come in their life. The sharia begins to come in their life. 
prayer begins to come into their life. What do I mean by prayer? Prayer is in everybody's life. Not that prayer. Not the prayer where you're just knocking out the four rakah to get it done so you can be back to do what else you were doing. That prayer where depth develops, where you begin to really connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right? And that's what's required in the in the beginning. Prayer, Quran, um, giving sadaqa, spending time doing good, doing dhikr, etc. Learning about the deen, that's your initial phase. And everybody has to go through it, and it's better to do it when you're young. Because that's when you have energy. Now, then what ends up happening is after that initial period of development, then a person becomes attached. And once they become attached, then the work that's required is much less. Look, when you first plow a plot of land, it takes a lot of work to actually soften the soil, to prepare the soil, to fertilize the soil. Then you put the seed in the soil. Then you cover the seed with soil. You water the soil. You water the soil. Eventually, the crop comes up. Now, once the crop comes up and that connection is made, then you just give a little bit of water and everything else falls into place. But you have to make that initial effort to begin with. Now, once a person makes that initial effort and actually begins to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that phase of being alone, of withdrawing from your habits, of withdrawing from your company, of withdrawing from your daily routine, that disappears. And instead, the deen has designed within itself the ability to perpetuate that state. How? Well, look, the way that state is perpetuated is by an individual giving their selves to Allah 100%. Now you think about the deen and the way it's designed, it's made that way. For example, we have the month of Ramadan, which is coming up just in a, mo- a couple months, right? Less than a couple months. Now when the month of Ramadan comes, what happens? Our schedules change. Our priorities change. Our focus changes. And everything becomes about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's actually that initiation phase. Everybody goes through it once a year. It's built into the deen. The other way it's built into the deen is the hajj. What happens? A person saves up money. All right? They plan, they prepare, they think, they make all these niyas, and then they go for hajj. Now when they go for hajj, they leave their friends. They leave their family. They leave their routine. They leave what they thought was important to them, and they go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to literally circle around his home until he connects them back to himself. So that's the purpose of the Hajj, that we come back as newborn babies. What does that mean? We don't come back physically as babies. It means that all of the garbage that we loaded ourselves with over this lengthy lifetime, we remove all of that and we come back as pure as a baby, as connected as a baby, as natural as a baby is in their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, those are some ways by which we initiate this connection within the deen. And then the deen is designed to propagate it. How do you propagate it? Five times a day. When you stand up for salah, it's a jeeb. What do we do when we stand up for salah? We say takbir al-tahrim, right? Takbir al-tahrim means to make something haram. The takbir that makes things haram. What does it make? It makes everything haram except Allah. This takbir, when we raise our hands for salah, makes everything haram except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No talking, no eating, no looking, no turning. You can't do anything. No thinking. You're not even allowed to think about what you want to think about. Everything becomes Allah. You have to focus on Allah. So five times a day, that solitude is actually built into the deen. That solitude that's necessary to develop and, and protect a connection with Allah is actually built into the deen. So the means of propagating that connection with Allah and establishing it are built into the deen. And similarly, the means of propagating it is built into the deen. So the establishment and the propagation. So there's no excuse. The defect is not in the deen. The defect then becomes in the person who practices the deen. Why? Because they don't give 100%. When we give 95% and the boat drags, then we complain and we say, why aren't we experiencing the deen? Why aren't we feeling what the deen is about? And why aren't we experiencing the benefits that Allah bestows upon a group of people that believe? Then the question is, what's happening to the Muslim ummah? Why are all these things facing the Muslim ummah? Why is the Muslim ummah so humiliated? Well, there is no way that a person connected to Allah would be that humiliated. So then the question becomes, are we really connected to Allah? That's actually the question that we should ask ourselves. In these kind of difficult times, when we see the whole ummah just burning, 
around us, right? And then we start wanting to point fingers and blaming everybody. Actually, the, the question should be, are we connected to Allah? Because that's the only question. Because if we're connected to Allah and this happens, fine. We're out of here and we're in Jannah anyway because we were connected to Allah. And if we're, dis- if we're, if we're, if we're uh, connected to Allah and this, and, or if we're disconnected to Allah and this happens, then we are the ones that were the losers. So instead of, we go in so many circles trying to point fingers and trying to come up with excuses, this actually is what it's about. It's about Allah. Nothing happens except through Allah's will. And no one can receive, be rewarded or punished except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them or punishes them. Everything else is a board game. So where our focus lies is actually the question. And everybody knows where their focus lies. SubhanAllah, at the moment that we're supposed to be focused on Allah, we're thinking about everything except Allah. The five times a day, the few minutes that Allah required us to sit down and be focused on Him and Him alone, to worship Him and think about Him alone, at that time of the day, we're totally into everything except Allah. So where is our connection with Allah? How can we expect to be treated as the servants of Allah? And how can we expect to have the taste that's bestowed upon those people who are connected to Allah? All right. The purpose of this is not to sit down and create a sad outlook for what where we are because the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen is so created that a person can make up this lost ground at any moment. It's unique. You know, in life, if you mess up, it's over. Once you get beyond a certain point, you can never make it up. Like the brothers study to take the LSAT or the MCAT. Once they mess up the MCAT, it's over. That score is on your record. You can never remove it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's recording is totally different. You can spend your whole life turning away from Allah. You can spend your whole life disobeying Allah. You can spend your whole life sinning against Allah. But in the end, if you turn back to Allah, He makes you start back from square one. And your whole past record becomes eliminated. So much so that the angels who wrote don't even remember. SubhanAllah. That's the deal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the individual that wants to turn back to them. And that's exactly what each of us have to take advantage of. We would be fools to try to please anyone except Allah. Because you will never please anyone. There is no way. It doesn't matter how they're related to you, we can never please any being except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the only one that overlooks the way our mistakes need to be overlooked. We're human beings. We're full of faults. The only one that will overlook those mistakes the way they need to be overlooked is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So actually now the challenge is not in constructing a new deen. The challenge is not in coming up with a new way to approach Allah. The challenge is not in, in trying to balance things so that we can attain some sort of nearness to Allah that we've created in our own minds. The challenge is to submit to Allah. There's no other challenge in the deen. The challenge is to take what Allah revealed upon us to take what the Prophet them emulated for us and to walk exactly on that path. Because on that path lies success and on that path lies wilaya, which is the friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all that our responsibility is, is to find out what Allah requires of us and to submit to it and to do exactly what He requests and to refrain from exactly what he asks us to refrain ourselves from. So that's the challenge. If an individual does that, they attain this nearness to Allah, and they attain its benefits, which include honor in this life, and jannah in the hereafter. And if a person does not, then they attain difficulty in this life, and then they attain a extreme difficulty, which is far beyond anyone's imagination, and far outweighs anything that any human being can produce in this life in the hereafter. That's the day of misery. That will be the day of loss. That will be the day when people will say, would I had, should I had. So why would we wait till that day when we're so certain about its existence? Why not pretend that it exists now? We should think about our lives. We should ask ourselves what we need to do, why we're not doing what we should be doing, and begin to submit ourselves completely. Seek out the sunnah. Seek out the sharia. Seek out depth in prayer. Seek out time for dhikr. Seek out a relationship with the Qur'an. Seek out good company. These are the things that allow this seed that exists within us to bloom. 
That's the only way that it's going to bloom. It's the only way that it's going to produce that beautiful garden called Islam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to be among those who attach our hearts to Him constantly, to be among those who are so attached to Him that they remember Him day and night, standing, sitting, lying, in company and outside of company. And may, may He make us among those who are rewarded among those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. وَآخِرُ تَعْوَانَا عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ